Hello, my name is David Oliver Kasdan, and I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Governance at Sung Kwan University. Today I'll talk about understanding of resilience. The lecture I'm going to talk about is specifically about resilience for disaster management and digital government in smart cities. Resilience has many applications for context, including things like individual behaviors, social structures, operational capacities, and the material withstanding of hazard effects. These applications will be explored with implications for the policies and services of digital governance for smart cities in developing countries. The lecture will go across six points, an overview, applications, policy approaches, practical tactics, cases and examples, and then integrating resilience across the digital governance spectrum. So first, what is resilience in disaster management and what does it mean? So in the context of disaster risk, the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, transform, and recover from the effects of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions through risk management. That definition is from the UNISDR. But basically, resilience means the ability to come back from a disaster and resume normal life. If we think about a rubber band and how it can stretch and then reform to its original shape, this is essentially what we mean by resilience. As the global community moves towards the theme of anticipation rather than prevention in disaster management, new understandings of key concepts are being developed. Now, this is a very significant shift in the focus, trying to fight the onslaught of hazards through the perspective of humans versus nature is a losing game. We should look instead to the idea that hazards are inevitable and they should be an expected element of humans existing with nature. So when we shifted from anticipation to prevention, some people also thought that we were trying to move away from the idea of prediction because prediction, again, assumes that we can control and deal with a disaster when in fact we need to live with it. And resilience is part of our ability to live with it. It's a complement in that term of adaptation. Now, Aaron Wildowski, a public administration scholar, favors resilience as a workable alternative to anticipation because of the need to prepare for the unknown rather than using a sort of goals means thinking paradigm. As a counter to the engineering solutions mode, he asks whether piling on safety measures actually improves safety. He prefers that society focuses on enhancing resiliency, which accommodates both known and unknown hazards, rather than attempt to protect itself through strictly controlling risks. Let me add a little bit more about the idea that when we add safety measures, and we try to, as Wildowski says, pile on safety measures, it changes our relationship with hazards. It assumes, or it makes us feel like we should assume, that the more safety measures we have in place, the safer we will be. But we're, again, we're dealing with the unknown. And when we deal with the unknown, we shouldn't get complicit or compliant about these things. When it comes to applications of resilience for urban contexts, we have to think about this a little bit differently. And there's significant opportunity for integrating smart city and digital governance with resilience in developing countries. But the urban context requires special consideration for resilience and disaster management for several reasons. First off, we have a density of a population. This means that, number one, there's so many more people to contend with, and their needs are all going to be different, and they're going to overlap and sometimes be disparate from each other. And that also means that, literally, the physical space is going to have a lot more people to deal with and less room for maneuvering. We have to think about the behavior and characteristics of residents. Urban dwellers are different than rural dwellers. They have less tools and less abilities and things around them in terms of actually dealing with the material physical world when they live in an apartment high rise. There's also issues about political power with respect to national government or higher levels of government. A large city has a lot of political power in a country yet it still has to abide and sometimes contend with national policy and regulation. 
There's also a history of disasters and policies that may be in place for an urban area. The age and quality of infrastructures, things like the road conditions, sewer systems, subway lines, all of these things are, are issues that need to be contended with in the context of an urban smart city with digital governance. And then finally, we have to think about logistics and social service distributions. And this sort of links back again to the idea of density. Moving things around a city is a little bit more difficult sometimes when it comes to supplies or emergency services trying to deal with people when there's a disaster. As I mentioned, urban dwellers are less prepared in a way for disasters due to their living style. Living in an apartment with limited space, you don't have as much room for supplies that you might need in case of a disaster. And you're also somewhat more dependent on outside services for needs. And urban governments are often taxed with competing interests and burdens of support. There's local political interests versus national mandates, as I mentioned. The scale of responsibilities in a city is not always co uh, commensurate with the size of the population. And so there's limited resources to deal with. There's also the issues of coordination and communications that are specialized for their landscape, whether it's actually having radio contact with all of the buildings around, as well as just, again, moving people through a difficult landscape that's vertical as well as horizontally distributed. Now, urban policies that promote resilience need to be specialized as well as dynamic, changeable, to contend with the development of the city. There's the pressures of space and density and the need for economic growth to support a population. Coastal urban areas have, of course, higher vulnerability to climatological and meteorological hazards. The climate change effects that especially hit these coastal areas may require radical and drastic redistricting. We're seeing this in coastal cities like New York and the United States, where the development that's along the river and the ocean sides need to be changed, if not actually withdrawn. We also have to think about upgrading infrastructures for resilience, which is very costly and not visible. And in this sense, when it comes for urban disaster management and building resilience, these are the kinds of projects that aren't especially exciting, and they're hard to sell to the population and get the funding and the regulations available, but it's something that needs to be done. And then, of course, we also have to think about the social dimensions of development. These are factors in the adoption of the technologies. There's 10 essentials for making cities resilient as an operational framework put out by the Sendai framework at the local level. And you can see those here. Policy approaches to build resilience. We have to start from the conception of resilience as a socio-cultural quality of a population. This means that the people have characteristics and behaviors that are specialized to a particular context, be it a city or a country or a region. But it's, as we're talking about urban areas here, we have to think about the socio-cultural quality of a city. And the policy approaches in this case can include supporting citizen-government interactions for mitigation, such as training or drills, building social capital with community organizations focusing on communication of disaster risk. For example, you could structure an apartment group or a small district community organization where they set up communication lines and means of notifying people in case there is disaster risk. There has to be public information campaigns that promote resilient practices, such as maintaining safety equipment, knowing evacuation routes, stockpiling supplies, and so on. And then there's also the option of sponsoring crowdsourcing efforts to improve resilience through mechanisms of community ownership, what we call sometimes the endowment effect. For example, if you can sponsor some sort of web app where people take charge of maintaining their own area, whether it's removing snow on the sidewalks for access, or perhaps it would be uh, clearing drainage so there won't be flooding in the streets, and getting people to participate on their own through interactive apps, especially in a smart city, can be a very effective mechanism. 
More specifically, with smart cities and digital governance policies for resilience, we can emphasize things like tying the technological infrastructure of the smart city with funding projects that enhance resilience measures. What this means is that sometimes it's easier to add on resilience, member, uh, resilience measures to existing or planned infrastructure projects that aren't specifically about disaster management. Because disaster management, again, is something you can't always see and isn't always very attractive. If the disaster is not happening right then, it's out of people's attention. So this can include leveraging national government funding through side channels of disaster management, like education programs. It can also include policy languages that ties to the sustainable development goals and the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction to legitimize expenditures and promote resilience as a policy motivator. You can also find support from the Making Cities Resilient 2030 campaign of localizing efforts, again from the UNDRR. Some practical tactics of a resilient smart city include things like mobile applications that give nudges, if you've heard of that term in behavioral economics, where we try to influence or encourage people to make good decisions for small risk reduction measures. Things like offering live data about the resources and conditions and constraints on resilience through government sites, having an app that is constantly updated and dynamic can engage people. It can include things like images from weather cams and current readings from IoT devices on environmental quality. You can also solicit citizens to upload imagery of their own through social media for sharing and analysis with the data centers. Again, this is similar to crowdsourcing. Again, let's mention the idea about legitimizing IoT and big data facilities as real-time resilience monitors to gain citizen support. Spending money on new technology just for the sake of shiny new technology isn't always a great idea. But when it's tied in with other purposes and ideas that will work with resilience efforts, that can gain a lot more legitimacy. You can partner with private sectors, particularly the technology sector, for joint efforts by leveraging permits, tax incentives, or other discretionary authority in the city to promote resilience. You can inform citizens of the redundancies and contingency preparations in place for disasters for digital governance needs. This will support their own interest as well as gain more participation as they know what is actually being done for them. You can also integrate disaster management mitigation processes across the smart city plan. You tether or link together smart and resilience in the same sentence every time just as sustainability and green technology are integral to new developments. Here are a few cases and examples that you can use for adaptation. First one we look at is in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where they have a dual-use tunnel. So they made an almost 10-kilometer long stormwater management and road tunnel, called, called SMART, that was constructed at a cost of almost $500 million to contend with heavy rain hazards. But the tunnel has three levels. It's not just for drainage, but also for road traffic. And, as well, it allows large volumes, of flood, large volumes of flood water to be diverted from the city's financial district. Although the smart tunnel was a significant investment up front, it's continued to successfully avert the hazard of flash floods and has saved as much money in potential losses with, toll, as what, with the toll revenues to recoup the costs. You can also look at the city of Niteroi, Brazil, where they had outdated management systems that were upgraded in 2014 with geo-information geo management systems that integrate and manage and coordinate data across all the different departments of the city. In this case, they could use public services, land use, geo-information, and ortho photos of the city so they could monitor data, mobility, water quality, and other key indicators as well as simplifying the plot mapping processes connected to the municipal land registry. Part of disaster management, of course, is knowing where the disaster is and being able to manage the data as it comes in, in place. So in this case, city staff can use their mobile application and do updates from the field, pictures of buildings and plots, and immediately verify it with the city's database. System also helps to st simulate flood patterns monitor forest fire risk and other uses related to disaster management and resilience. Finally, we'll look at the 
case of the Observatory of Urban Resilience in Dakar, or ORUD. In Dakar, Senegal's population has increased five times over a generation. So they're dealing with over 2.5 million people today. And this has had a large strain on their urban systems. So the Observatory of Urban Resilience of Dakar was created as a technical steering tool for officials in charge of urban development to create the synergy and efficiency of the design, implementation, and other parts of their res resilience-based policies. And it includes raising awareness of issues that are critical to improving resilience in the face of unforeseen events and coordinating the implementation of the roadmap. Finally, let's talk about integrating resilience across the digital governance spectrum. Resilience as a quality of digital governance requires both hardware and software considerations. The hardware needs have to be tailored to the context and the software needs have to be, have consideration for the population's socio-cultural profile. On the hardware side of things, we can think of IoT sensors, alarms, emergency operation modes, smart infrastructure that all need to be clearly identified for their resilience contributions. And again, particularly for coastal cities, the hardware should facilitate hazard monitoring and warning capabilities. On the software side of things, the tone and means of conveying resilience information must match the behavioral patterns and cognitive style of the citizens. How the messages are given and the interpretation of big data, for example, must be actionable by the average person. So all the technology and all the new developments still have to have an audience that's receptive to it. Shah and authors in 2019 describe a comprehensive approach to disaster resilient smart cities using big data analytics. And in this case, their implementation model of the environment consists of data harvesting, aggregation, processing, and analytics for a service platform. And the variety of data sets, such as smart city buildings, pollution, traffic simulator, and Twitter, are utilized for the validation and evaluation of the system to detect and generate alerts for a fire in a building, pollution levels in the city, emergency evacuation paths, and so on, all this collection of information about natural disasters is available. Now, this assumes both the hardware and software capacities of the government are thoroughly developed and integrated. So there's a distinct need for the proper policy to be implemented to permeate the urban context for effective resilience capacity. Such policies must account for the ethics of data valence as well. In this case, as governments collect information about the population, you also have to make sure that the population is okay with the collection of that data. The acquisition of technologies must include both the tactical aspects of training and maintenance with the strategic goals of long-term sustainability in dynamic environments, including funding streams and policy evaluation plans to make sure that the things are going as planned. The technology needs to serve the objective and be a solution to a defined problem, not a solution looking for a problem, to ensure that you have political support and compliance. Here you can see a proposed reference architecture for big data and IoT-based disaster resilient smart city. Finally, in summary, resilience as a quality of developing smart city disaster management efforts is open to many, many innovative opportunities. Big data and IoT have significant applications for enhancing resilience when paired with sustainable mitigation policies. The integration of technology for resilience can utilize both existing infrastructure developments and extension to disaster management, as well as share disaster management functions back to general urban maintenance functions to bolster legitimacy. Nonetheless, resilience is primarily related to a city's socio-cultural context that must be integrated into any digital governance approaches. Thank you for listening, and good luck.